So today we're going to continue on our 2023 best food plot planning series. Today we're going to do part two. We're going to talk about brassicas. Now brassicas are those great big leafy plants that produce big bulbs, big leaves, great nutrition, great attraction. You know, you see in the hunting magazines or on the hunting shows, hunting channels, deer standing in belly high brassica plants. That's what we're trying to get. That's what we're trying to achieve. And it's not hard to do. You gotta have the right soil, right planting depth, right seed ratio. We're gonna talk about all that today, how to get the great brassica plantings that we've been known to produce here at Northwoods Whitetails. Let's talk about brassicas. What are they? Well, here at Northwoods, the varieties we use in our Sweet Feast brassica blend, as well as our short season Southern States brassica blend, are turnips, radishes, and the brassica, forage brassica, leafy type plants, kale, rape, also known as can canola or collards. Now, we have a 30% to 70% leafy brassica to tuber producing plant. And what I mean by that is between the radishes and the turnips, we have 70% in our sweet feast blend. I believe that's 50% in the southern states short season brassica blend and then 30% with the forage brassicas, the kale, the rapes, the canolas, collards. Now, we always are playing with that ratio. It might be 75 to 25. We're still trying to get that perfect, but that last 5%, every year we seem to be messing with that just a little bit. But by and large, the Sweet Feast blend has been the same recipe, same plants for the last, oh, 12 years. Now, we had, uh, I think, about five years into production, we had a variety of forage brassica we really, really liked. It produced great big leaves, a lot of food, and it simply, they stopped selling it. We couldn't find it anywhere, so we've replaced that. We feel that we've done a good job replacing it, but by and large, the recipe has stayed the same from day one. So we use turnips. Uh, we use three different varieties of turnips. There's dozens of varieties of turnips. We found some turnips we really like. We've found through testing, we've found some turnips we really don't like. We just don't like the size or lack of size. We don't like the lack of leaf ratio on them. We like uh, three different varieties of turnips that mature anywhere from 75 to about 90, 95 days. We want that long extended season from September here in Michigan all the way to January attraction. We don't want everything to be attractive and come to maturity early or late. We want something available for the deer from September, late September, all the way to January. But again, I don't like a monoculture planting of brassicas. I don't just like a straight brassica plot. Brassicas, in our opinion and our strategy, is part of the buffet system that we set up for these deer. We use radishes. Now, we like a radish that we found that has a great percentage of leaf, green leaves, and there's a lot of them and a large producing tuber. There's a lot of varieties of radishes out there. And honestly, last year we tried a brand new variety, had it here in a strip in our backyard food plot. I was shocked. The deer ate the tops, will not touch the turnip. I'm sorry, they would not touch the radish, the actual radish itself. We had a food plot in late January when the thaw came full of rotting, decaying radishes the deer simply wouldn't eat. As compared to the radishes we've always used, they destroyed those. Those are all gone. So we're always testing, you know, just because it says it's a deer radish or it's a radish doesn't mean it's something that you want in your food plot. We found a variety they simply here in Michigan in our backyard they wouldn't eat, and that's quite shocking. The forage brassicas, the kales, rapes, canola, collards, what are those? Those are a big leafy plant that really do not have a bulb on them. They're just bred for grazing food production. They usually are uh, very high nutrients for the deer. Now a lot of sheep farmers in New Zealand, a lot of these come from New Zealand. Uh, the sheep farmers, some cattle farmers use these to feed their deer, feed their sheep, and they have a great frost tolerance. Some of them will stay green all the way into January here. Some of them aren't bitter at all, like kale. One of the reasons we have about 5% kale in our sweet feast blend is because of early season attraction. Now you go to the supermarket and buy kale. It's probably not the same kale we're using. There's a lot of varieties of kale, but it's not bitter. It's as, some of them are sweet tasting and the deer react the same way. Great September, early October attraction is kale. We also have a forage brassica 
that is frost tolerant. We have another brassica that is frost tolerant all the way down to about 15 degrees. So again, we have all these varieties to stretch that attraction from, again, here in Michigan, September, late September, all the way to January. Now, the further south you go, that attraction might be moved back a little bit. But our brassica blend, you don't need frost to have the deer starting to eat it. So those are the varieties we use. Those are the most common varieties in most brassica plantings. I know some people try lettuce, they try cabbage, they try, I've even seen someone try eggplant. You know, I, it just, one's too much, too much. So these are the varieties we recommend we use in our sweet feast blend. So soil recommendations and planting recommendations. This is where I see a lot of the brassica failures um, happen. They don't have the soil correct. We like a good soil, and what I mean by that is organic matter, two, seven, two, eight, closer to three, over three is better. 2.8% organic matter, six on the pH. Now, when we talked about soil, organic matter in the, our organic matter building video, it's very similar to a sponge. Brassicas need a lot of moisture to sustain growth. So we like to see this organic matter. If you're down in the 1.2s, 1.8, maybe even two, you might not be ready for brassica. Now they'll grow, but you, not, you might not get them to reach their full potential. So I like to see this as close to three as possible. pH is another one. I've grown them in 5.9 pH, but it was a lot of lime, a lot of liquid lime to get them to go. They reached their full potential, but one of the theories I have, and I've seen this a lot, that people say, hey, they don't eat my brassicas. They are not gonna, they're not smashing them like they should. They kind of stick their nose up at it. And a lot of times, you know, it's yellow, it's purple. A lot of the times it's like a 5.5 five pH. It's not high enough. Now, this is my theory. I don't know, I, I can't prove it. It's just everything I've seen when I've seen brassica failures or brassicas um, unattractive pH wasn't high enough. I firmly believe that the lower the pH, um, it, it, it uh, affects the taste of the brassicas to the deer. So that's just what I believe. I can't prove it. I really don't think someone can disprove it. I don't, I just, everything I've seen leads me to believe you've got to get this number up. This pH has to be up as close to seven as possible. You've got to get your nutrients right. When we do a soil test, on our food plots, it's usually where the brassicas are gonna go. So we know what the nutrients are gonna be. We know exactly what the pH is gonna be. So that's what we recommend we do a soil test. We'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about fertilization. Now we offer two products here at Northwoods. We've our Sweet Feast Brassica Blend, which is our number one seller. I don't think there's a better blend in the country. I just don't. For tonnage, for all season attraction, we've worked on this a long time. This has been in production since 2012, I believe. And it's a great mix. 75 to 90 day maturity date on these turnips. And we plant it at six pounds an acre. We sell it in three pound bags. Now last year, because of the drought throughout the Midwest, we had a lot of folks have brassica planting failures. We might've got a little bit of rain and then he died right away, or they just simply didn't plant them. Okay. And it's a long growing season on these turnips and these brassica varieties. So what we found was a turnip variety that was a 45 day maturity. We found some radishes and some forage brassicas that can do well in a short period of time. We put that together, three pound bag, half acre, six pounds to the acre, and we sold it to folks who wanted to plant late August. Typically here, we're planting late July, maybe the first three to five days of August, pending rain. But these short season Southern state brassicas it's a 45 day maturity, so you can plant it later. Now we had folks in Michigan here plant it, got great results. You're not gonna get the tonnage compared to the sweet feast, but you're going to get a great brassica planting. Our friends down south, you know, we're planting here in, in uh, the Midwest, mid, early to mid August, they've got a hundred degree weather down there. It's scorching hot. No one wants to plant brassicas in that weather. So it's late August, early September, when the rains start to return historically, the, the temperatures cool down. They start to get some dew in the morning. Now they're looking at planting their brassicas, but their season starts early October. They need quick growth. They need fast growth. 
And that's where this 45 days short season Southern States brassica comes into play. So if you got a short planting window and you still want brassicas, this is a pretty good choice. Situations, big plots, kill plots, and then we'll talk about what to do if the deer won't eat it. I really don't like seeing brassicas in the small kill plot. Unless you're in an egg area, we had a farm we were working on in Wisconsin. We had a little tiny eighth, eighth of an acre food plot right off a major alfalfa field. And it actually survived and the deer did not browse it down and it made it all the way to Thanksgiving. Now you think about an egg area, deer are spoiled. They've got beans, they've got alfalfa. Uh, they might start nipping at the corn in October. Brassicas might not be a huge draw, but you start to get the cold weather, those beans are gone, that alfalfa starts to brown down, suddenly those brassicas are phenomenal draw. But you get into a big woods area or an area that doesn't have a lot of egg, that nice bright green brassica full of moisture, an eighth acre plot might not survive. Now you think about a kill plot in the woods, possibly trees, shade issue, getting sunlight issue. Uh, brassicas are a big, a big broadleaf plant. They need sunlight. So a hidden kill plot might not be the best situation for brassicas. Now where we like brassicas is the big destination food plots where we're doing half our cereal grain, greens mix, and we might have some clover in there, but we've also got a big brassica planting. You know, it depending on what your situation is when you're hunting, you might do 50% brassica, you might do 60% brassica, or you might do 30% brassica. That's where we really like it, out in those big destination food plots, where you can get a lot of tonnage growing, you can hold a lot of deer in the evening, and you can get a lot of sunlight, you can get some equipment in there if you need to get nutrients to the ground. That's where we really like brassicas. You can get full sun to these big plots, you're not shading out the brassicas, and they're going to reach their full potential. That's where we like it. Now, one of the things we've seen, and this will go back to this pH, deer won't eat my brassicas. I know a gentleman in lower Michigan, he's got great soil and he just cannot eat, or I'm sorry, his deer will not eat brassicas, but his neighbor two, three miles down the road, they devour it. I just, I, I feel sorry for the gentleman because brassicas are, you know, the nutritional value in the cold weather, the attraction as part of that buffet system we like to create. It's just brassicas are a great planting. So what do I do if the deer won't eat it? Well, the number one thing we recommend is make sure your soil is right. Get these numbers correct. Okay, make that brassica taste good. Another thing, if your soils are correct, what we recommend you can drop at planting, you can add some crimson clover. I've done 100 pounds of winter peas per acre. Okay, if you're getting uh, the the um, fertilizer covered you can plant the winter peas as well get those buried and then come back and put your brassicas down soybeans buckwheat candy crops early season attraction to get the deer to that food plot and then they're going to start on those candy crops and then transition to brassicas that will also help but i don't recommend planting cereal grains with the brassicas i don't really don't recommend that you know we want to get that tonnage to produce we don't want the cereal grains drowning out those brassicas so Planting. How do I plant brassicas and get a successful plot? Now, this is where I see a lot of mistakes made. First mistake I see is they bury the brassicas too deep. Now, the rule of thumb, we've talked about this, is the, side of, the size of the seed is, is about as deep as you want to plant it. And you think about those little tiny turnip seeds, they're the size of a pinhead. You do not need to uh, get these buried very deep. You don't need to disc them in. You don't need to drag them in. You don't need to plant them very deep. What we do here historically, typically, is we have red clover growing right now where we're going to plant our brassicas, okay? We're going to go in and we're going to put our required fertilizer down. If we need lime, we're going to put the lime down and we're going to run our tiller about a half inch to an inch deep just to terminate the red clover as well as bury the fertilizer. We'll come back with a lawn roller and we'll pack that ground. We'll spread our brassicas and then we'll pack it one more time and we're done. That's as shallow as you need to plant brassicas. They are not a big seed. You don't want to bury them too deep. So fertilization recommendations. We're going to get a lot of pushback on it and I understand it. Now what we're working with Brad Harper on Harp, with Harper Growing Solutions on liquid recommendations so we can get away from granular fertilizer. But without seeing a soil test, 
what we've been taught from day one planting brassicas is you need again without seeing a soil test 200 pounds of 624-24 or triple 19 and then 150 pounds of nitrogen now that could be in the form of urea or what we like to do with some AMS I think it's 24002 and some slow release lawn fertilizer now if you're going to use lawn fertilizer this is critical if you're going to use lawn fertilizer say from the home Home Depot or Menards, typically it's a 3003. You do not want to use weed and feed. Do not use lawn fertilization with weed killer in it, okay? Because that contains 2,4-D that will kill the brassicas. Now, again, there's a lot of people saying that's the wrong fertilizer. This is that, that, I, I get it. But this is without seeing a soil test. This is a general recommendation. But the point being is this, folks. 100 pounds of triple 13 is not going to get your brassicas from August planting all the way to late October. We see it every year, whether it's a Northwoods product or on social media, we see those brassicas turn purple, turn yellow. They run out of nutrients. Make sure you feed these things, okay? 50 pounds of urea is not going to cut it. This is a long growing season with uh, plants that demand a lot of nutrients. Make sure you get that correct. Planting rate, six pounds an acre is what we recommend. We've tried seven. That was too much. We've tried 6.5. That was too much. We've tried 6.4. That was too much. I'm going to show you a photo of eight pounds per acre of brassica. Now that's a sad looking brassica planting. It's stunted, it's yellow, purple, short leaves, a little bit of green here and there, small bulbs, not very attractive. That's what eight pounds an acre of brassica gets you, okay? You think about, we just talked about the nutrient requirements on brassica and that's at six pounds an acre. Now add two more pounds an acre of that and you have to really increase that. Folks, I would rather see you underseed the brassicas than overseed it. Okay. And underseeding, what I mean is maybe you only got five and a half pounds an acre. You can come back and add some brassica. You, I mean, you'll know within two weeks if you've got it right or not. Okay. You can look at the spacing. You might see a gap here. Go drop a little bit more in there. You see a gap here. Go drop a little bit more there. If you overseed it and it looks like a putting green after two weeks of growth, it looks like a golf course. You way overseeded and there's not much you can do. You're going to struggle with big bulbs and big greens. So watch that seeding ratio. I'm going to show now you saw that picture. Now I'm going to show you a picture what a healthy at six pounds an acre brassica planting should look like at about eight weeks. Now that was an, a, a planting uh, a, a few years back. And it was a half acre and I used a three pound bag. And as I took the last step, the seed ran out. It was planted perfectly. That was one of the best brassica plantings we've ever had. I still make the mistake folks of overseeding brassicas. We'll share a link to a video we did last year on how you seed a brassica planting. Okay. But here's the thing. We tried seven pounds an acre early and it was way too much. We tried six and a half pounds per acre. That was still too much. 6.4. We were still on a 3.2 pound bag, 6.4 pounds per acre, still too much. We got it down to six pounds an acre and we found that that was a perfect ratio for brassicas. Now I want you to think about something for a second. If eight pounds an acre is what brassicas should be planted at and we're only selling six pounds an acre, we're losing money. And what I mean by that is we buy brassica by the pound. We sell, we sell brassica by the pound. So every three pound bag of brassica, if we're actually supposed to be selling a four pound bag, we're losing one pound of brassica sales. We're costing ourselves money. We're costing ourselves tens of thousands of dollars every year. But we sell it at six pounds to the acre because we know that it was what is the best result. If I sold it to you by, at eight pounds an acre, do you know how many phone calls I'm going to be getting? My brassicas are stunted. My brassicas look like crap. They're purple. My tubers, turnips are the size of a golf ball. I've been doing this a long time, folks. We've got it perfect. We've got it right. 
six pounds an acre is where you want to plant your brassicas. Attraction. Like I said before, we have seven varieties in our brassica blend. September here in Michigan, all the way to January. Illinois, it might be mid-October, early October, all the way into January. Tennessee, it might be mid to late October, all the way into February, depending on where you're at, okay? Depending on when you plant. But we offer this attraction to complement the clovers and the cereal grains to create that buffet system. Okay, I don't just want some turnips in the mix that the deer are going to be attracted to late October, December, January. Okay, I don't want a high percentage of radishes that are going to be great in the early season and then nothing's there in late season. So we've created a blend that's attractive from, let's just say, October 1st to January 1st. But again, it adds to that diversity of the buffet system we create with the multiple plantings in the food plot. Now, recently I've heard kale's not attracted to whitetails. That's funny, because I've seen dozens and dozens of pictures every year of mature bucks shot in the Sweet Feast blend. You know, some of these forage brassicas aren't attracted to whitetails. Again, see it every year. Not only do we see multiple dozens of mature bucks shot in this blend every year, I also get pictures of folks saying, John, they ate it to the ground. John, look at this picture. There's not a stem left. You know what I don't get? Gee, John, they ate everything but the kale. Gee, John, they ate everything but the forage brassicas. We don't get that. So, I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Be careful where you're getting your information from. All right. Finally, what do we look for and what do we want to avoid in a brassica blend? Number one pet peeve of mine to the point where it, it kind of makes me angry, it kind of makes me sad to see this nonsense. Sugar beets. Let me ask you all a question. How many of you are running out right now to go buy corn to put in your food plots this fall? Your August planting, your September planting. How many of you are running out to buy corn? I don't see anybody raising their hand because you're all smart. You fully understand if you go out and buy corn right now, it's not going to amount to anything. It's going to get about that tall. A deer might eat it, but you just wasted food plot space. Same thing with sugar beets. Minnesota, the Dakotas, here in my home state of Michigan, big sugar beet producers, but you know when they're planting? May. They're planting in May to get that football sized sugar beet, greens that are about three feet high. That's when you plant sugar beets. You plant corn in the spring. You plant a lot of the soybeans in the spring. You plant sugar beets in the spring. So why are these big buck seed companies putting sugar beets in their brassica blends? Why are these big hunting celebrities pushing this stuff, knowing full well that they're not going to amount to anything? Because it sounds cool and they're grabbing dollars out of your wallet. It is a money grab. It amounts to nothing. Okay. Last year, when we were planting our Sweet Feast blend, we took some of the sugar beets that we sell and we quit selling them in July. We stopped, we, we've stopped selling sugar beets a couple of weeks ago, actually, because they're not going to amount to anything. I don't want people buying them right now. But we took some of our sugar beets and put them in our garden, protected from the deer. You know how big they got? They got the size of a golf ball and they were about that tall. Not very attractive. Not very attractive at all. Now, think about this. Sugar beets are very slow growing and they like space. So now you put them in with a brassica blend. Let's say we threw some sugar beets in our sweet feast blend. Okay. Sweet feast blend usually canopies around six weeks. What I mean by that is the leaves are starting to touch and the sunlight underneath there is pretty much shut off. You think that slow growing sugar beet that that's tall in a jungle of brassica leaves that are that tall. Now what happens when you shut the, uh, you, you shut the sunlight out? because of brassica uh, canopied. That thing's done growing. It makes no sense, except to these companies that do it, it grabs your attention and it grabs your money. Avoid the mixes with sugar beets in it. It's a marketing scheme, it's a marketing gimmick, and it's going to cost you in food plot space that's better suited with some turnips, some radishes, and some forage brassicas. 
Radish percentage. You get asked this a bunch of times. You know, we have a 20 to 25 percent. Um, actually, it's about 20 percent radishes, maybe 15. I'd have to go check the label. We like the radishes. I think radishes are one of the best early season attractions there are. You know, we, we highly recommend maybe four pounds per acre with our greens planting, our grains planting. And then, like I said, it's about 15%, uh, maybe 20% radishes in our sweet feast blend. And there's a reason for that, especially in the northern third of the country. Now, if you take a radish in September and you break it open, it is full of moisture. It's probably the most, um, I don't even know how to describe it if there's a word for it, but it's probably one of the plantings that has the most moisture in it, okay? But with that moisture comes risk. And what I mean by that is in these northern states, Maine, you know, Vermont, maybe northern Minnesota, North Dakota, those states that get hard frost, early frost, late September, early October. I've seen 20 degrees here in Michigan uh, the first week of October, second week of October. We're getting hard frost already. What happens to all that moisture in those radishes? Well, it freezes. And now they're going through a freeze-thaw cycle and they start to rot. You know, a couple years ago, we had rotting radishes. The tops were still green, but the radishes itself were starting to rot mid-October already. Now, I haven't seen that for a couple years because we have such a warm weather. But you think about that. You have that freezing multiple nights, and now you get back up in the 60 degrees. What do you think happens to those radishes? So you guys in the northern states, the far northern states, you got to be careful with your radish percentage. Probably not a big deal. Um... Southern states, you know, Southern Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, obviously, Carolinas, that's, that's not going to be an issue. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons people like a lot of radishes, they like to use a lot of radishes, they talk about soil health, they're good for the soil, you know, da-da-da, you know, again, soil health, soil, this soil, that seems to be a big thing in the food plotting industry, and I fully agree with that. But this is our theory and our strategy. Take care of your soil, spring and summer. Take care of your deer in the fall and in the winter. Let's plant the best, most nutrient, food producing plants we can. Okay, so with these radishes, and again, they're one of the best early season attractions. But if I'm in Thanksgiving in, you know, Wisconsin, and I got a field full of rotting radishes. What what good is that for the deer? You're, it's going to help your soil, obviously. But what good is I'm here to I'm here to hunt deer on Thanksgiving, you know. So that's that's our theory. That's our philosophy. And honestly, that was confirmed a couple of weeks ago. You know, I always talk about we've got the YouTube uh, running here in the office, uh, the YouTube channels, you know, hunting channels and stuff. And there was a hunting show on. A guy was hunting over. Uh, I believe it was a pure radish plot, and it was. I think it was like the 1st of December. It was early December, late November, and there had been a lot of cold weather. He had a food plot full of rotting radishes. Now, there was still some green on the tops yet, but the radishes were as brown as this wall. And deer walked through them. He was picking at the tops, nipping at the green, didn't touch the radishes. So you got to be careful with that, which is why we use turnip varieties that the cold weather doesn't bother. So again, all season attraction with our Sweet Feast Brassica blend. All right, last thing I want you to be aware of, seed coating. You do not need seed coating on your brassicas. To get brassicas out of the ground, you need two things, proper planting depth and rain, moisture, okay? Where I'm standing used to be a food plot. One year, this food plot, we planted in brassicas. And as I was rolling in the last bit of brassica seed, we had, you know, tilled under red clover, packed it, put the brassicas down, packed it again. We got rain as I'm doing this. And that was in the afternoon. I believe it was on a Saturday. Sunday evening, I saw our first brassica leaf. There was no seed coating on that. How's that possible without a magic seed coating? Now, if you're in a prolonged drought and you've got brassica seeds out there, eh, that seed coating might be okay. But beyond, to be honest with you folks, I'm not planting in a drought. I'm waiting for rain. I've seen many brassica plantings, offerings with seed coating on it. You buy a three pound bag of brassica, you're only getting two pounds of seed. Okay. I have never once, 
I think we might have did a radish planting. We tried one of the radish plantings, the coated radishes next to our radishes, and I saw zero difference. But the coating, the coated radishes were twice as expensive. But me personally, I have never used seed coating on my brassicas other than that test. And I'll put our brassica plantings up against anyone's in the country, anytime, anywhere. Okay. Our brassicas, our Sweet Feast brassica blend, our Southern States brassica blends do not have seed coating. When I sell you three pounds of seed of brassicas, I want you to get three pounds of seed. Again, moisture and proper planting depth gets those seeds out of the ground, not some magic seed coating. So I hope this helps you folks. I hope you got, uh, you learned something, you know, whether using a Northwoods product or not, I hope you, you learned something because we want you to be successful with your brassic plantings. We want you to be successful with all plantings. And that's why we're doing this series. We're trying to wade through all the nonsense that's out there, especially this time of year. Like I said, we got all the pro staffers and YouTube stars and everybody plant this, plant that. But you know what? Very few of them walk you through the steps on how to get a successful food plot planting, a successful brassica planting. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff here. You know, there's a lot of people that are going to argue about the um, fertilization thing. You know, it's it's not the same for everybody. Again, that's a general a general recommend. Rec, I can't talk this morning. A general recommendation without seeing a soil test. So I hope you learned something. If you've got questions, by all means, ask them in the comments below. You can reach out to us. We'll try to get back to you right away because brassica planting for us is about three weeks away. It's coming quickly. So hopefully you're successful. Hopefully you learned something. And again, if you want probably the best brassica offering there is on the market today at quite honestly, the best price I've seen for brassicas High quality seed at the, probably the lowest price. Check out our Sweet Feast Brassica blend at northwoodswhitetails.com. Thanks for watching, folks. Thank you so much for helping the channel grow. And we'll see you in a few days when we're going to talk about cereal grains and greens.